So again, very incredibly honoured to be introducing Heather Turner. Okay, so I was busy thinking about microphones. I'm not quite sure um, how much was said about, um, about my connections to forwards. Um, so this is sort of really the, the hat I'm wearing today. Um, forwards is a, the task force that was set up by the R Foundation uh, with the mission to uh, widen the participation of underrepresented groups in the R community. Well, in fact, um, the, the background is really that um, there was a focus on, on widening the participation of women. And uh, I think people in the R community were aware of this for uh, quite some time, but not a lot of action was, was taken to, to address the issue. Um, and I... I um, obviously, there's no fixed date, but so I think one significant thing that happened was that there was a panel at USAR 2014, um, which was in the States, can't quite remember where off at the minute. Um, but you can see there were a few of us, including myself, you might, you might recognize me sort of in the middle there, um, that were uh, just asked to, to discuss this issue at, at the conference, and then there was an open session where, where people could... Uh, discuss the issue, and, and it just brought it onto the agenda. And the year following that, the Forwards Task Force was set up, as I say, initially with the mission to, uh, to focus on women, um, and Our Ladies Global was set up the year after that. So it, that, that's sort of, um, in the past five years or so, um, there's, there's started to be this, this increased awareness of, of the imbalance in the community and more proactive action in trying to address it. Mm. Okay. Uh, so to give a bit more background about forwards and, and how we work, it's a fairly small task force. We've got about maybe 30 members, uh, some of whom are our foundation members and then other members that we invited on from the community uh, to try and um, represent particular groups. And uh, we've split ourselves up into six teams to focus on, to sort of tackle this problem from different angles. So we have a, a Twitter account and a blog, so a social media team, um, raising the profile of underrepresented groups, helping to communicate um, events and opportunities of interest. Um, a community team, which is seeking to uh, reach out to, to different parts of the community, for example, linking up. Um, to uh, particular community groups like Our Ladies or um, Transcode, which is a, a workshop uh, conference um, focusing on uh, issues in the transgender community and, and different things as they pop up and also connecting to other programming committees like Julia and Python, uh, seeing what they're doing and what we can learn from each other. The conferences team, which has really been focused on the R Foundation endorsed conferences um, in particular, the Use R conference, and there's been a lot of change in recent years. For example, the introduction of diversity scholarships, um, facilities for parents, um, uh, special events for newcomers, a whole different range of initiatives that have been introduced to try and make the conference more accessible, more welcoming to everybody. Um, the OnRants team, um, the idea there is that we're trying to help people move from users to developers to get more involved in contributing to the R project itself or to CRAN packages. Um, surveys team has done a little bit of work, um, mainly on uh, surveying participants that use R and seeing how the demographics have changed over the years. Um, and the teaching team, uh, among other things, has... Um, develop the package development workshop materials that I was using yesterday um, at, at the workshop. So that's a little bit about forwards, um, but I certainly don't want to give the impression that the forwards is, is the only um, organization in, in the game and the, and the only people that have been making any difference. That, that's far from the truth. Um, there's lots of things that have been going on in recent years, and I'm only naming a few here. So first of all, thinking about initiatives in the wider community, there have been several conferences and workshops that have sprung up in recent years, um, trying to um, uh, cater and interest a particular uh, groups uh, in the tech community, in the data science community. Um, so I mentioned here Women in Data Science, which is a, has a, 
a main conference at Stanford University in the US, but then it has lots and lots of satellite conferences around the world um, where people can, can meet locally and, and perhaps stream some of the talks and then combine that with local content. So that's been a, a really great way to reach women uh, globally. Uh, Black in AI, a, a group that um, started a few years ago and had workshops at the New Rips conference, which you might have heard of, which is a, a very large conference that focuses on machine learning. And um, it's uh, catering to the black community in general, so it has in, encouraged uh, and enabled people from Africa in particular to go across to the, this big conference, but also, of course, uh, African Amer Americans and other people of color. Um, then there are various meetups that are particularly targeting uh, specific groups, such as women in machine learning and data science, and we have some people here that are involved in that. Um, and uh, again, Queer in, a in AI, which is again related to uh, NeurIPS and the sort of machine learning community, but works in a slightly different way. It's a bit more of a, a networking group, and they have more social events rather than sort of technical workshops. Um, I think uh, the Carpentries has, has had quite a big influence because they're focused on making data science techniques accessible to everybody. And as part of that, they have, uh, you know, they're very conscious of equity and inclusion. And they were working on a roadmap um, last year to think about, you know, how to do that even better and to, you know, to reach more people um, around the world. And I know there's been a lot of work again. Um, in Africa, and probably other people here can, can speak about that, that better than me. But uh, again, I think that's one of the parallel things that's been going on and making a difference in the community. Um, NUM Focus, uh, which are an organization that, that supports a lot of um, open source software development um, and supports lots of uh, meetups and, and conferences, like, for example, Pi Data. Um, they have their own diversity and inclusion working group. And they had, for example, a very um, productive unconference a year or so ago that, that produced some very useful materials for event organizers and things like that. So I think across, <coughs> across the community, we, we've been working on this issue. And in the R community, we, we've benefited from, from this work. Thinking of the R community specifically, other than forwards and R ladies that I've already mentioned, I think R Open Sci has had a big impact on the community. So it's somewhat similar to Carpentries, you know, they're, they're sort of promoting reproducible science um, and enabling people to, to learn, um, learn the tools that they will need. And one th a couple of things that are particularly interesting about, about that um, organization is, again, rather than having conferences, they've, they've had this unconference model. If, if people don't know what I mean when I say unconf, it's an event where people turn up for a couple of days, and instead of having talks like this, um, then they, they, you know, they actually work together on problems and, and uh, developing software, uh, working on issues and so on, and uh, and new projects that, that people that they come up with to collaborative, collaboratively, and they work <coughs> on teams during those couple of days and try and produce something useful in that couple of days. Um, so it's a very accessible um, format. You know, people can come and they can pair program with more experienced programmers, and um, the R Open Science made a particular point of um, encouraging uh, people from underrepresented groups to attend and specifically reaching out to people and saying, why don't you come, you know, come and join us. And they have a community manager who's very good at organizing community calls and, and generally um, making the whole thing very accessible. And I think the Tidyverse Developer Day that's sort of, I was surprised when I was creating these slides that it only began last year. It feels like it's a, a fixture in, in, the, in the R ecosystem now. But again, it has a, a very similar model where the, uh, some members of our studio um, invite people to come and join them and work on developing the Tidyverse packages. And that's happened uh, before the R Studio Conf, the big conference that R Studio puts on, and also before the Use R conference. Um, and it will be happening again this year. And again, they set, they set aside you know, a bunch of tickets for people from underrepresented groups. So they're making sure that um, people know that they're welcome and that they're encouraged to come and get involved. And finally, the R Consortium. So just to clarify, the R Consortium is a group of companies that uh, support the R Project as opposed to the R Foundation, which is a not-for-profit 
organization. So the R Consortium have now set up an, their working group, uh, a diversity and inclusion working group, to support R Consortium projects and think particularly about things like R user group because R Consortium provides a lot of funding for R user groups um, and, uh, and uh, also conferences, smaller conferences. Um, so to think about how they can work towards diversity and inclusion um, in the projects that they fund. So there's a lot, a lot that's going on, and hopefully, um, hopefully that's news. Hopefully I'm not telling you what you already knew, know. Um, and I'm not going to show a lot of data, <laughs> um, but I think if you've been in the R community for a while, you will have just noticed that there's been a change. Um, and you know, one particularly obvious thing is, is the growth of our ladies. So it, it started actually in 2012 with just a single group, and then there were a couple of other towns that also set up their own Our Ladies group. And then back in 2016, Our Ladies Global was formed, and um, the Our Consortium funded a project um, that, where the whole idea was to expand Our Ladies around the world, and it was a very ambitious uh, target. I can't remember quite how many uh, groups they said in their original proposal that they wanted to set up, but I'm sure it was nothing like 188 uh, that, is, that is where it is today. So it's, it's seen really amazing great growth, and it's had an impact beyond our ladies in, in terms of the projects that they've taken on, in terms of the our user groups and conferences that, that our ladies have got involved with. Yeah, <laughs> I think that deserves a clap. And we can also see how that, how that works around, around the globe, or maybe you can see. So uh, the biggest group is in North America, followed by Europe, followed by South America. There's been a big growth in, in Latin America. And then we do have a bit of representation in Africa and, uh, and a few groups in Asia. So in terms of um, the sort of geographical spread, it's sort of fairly uh, similar to... Um, you know, where there's been greatest support for the R community historically, in other words, in Europe and the US. But it's encouraging to see that, um, uh, you know, there is the potential there, as in Latin America, to, to really spread this um, in uh, what I would call underserved regions. So what are our current challenges? This is trying to give you an overview of what's been happening in the past few years. And I would say our, um, our current challenges in terms of the user community are to think of outreach beyond white women. So just as we've seen in that last pie chart, of course, not everybody in the US and Europe is white, but you can imagine that uh, the communities are largely white. If you've been there, you, you will know. Um, so, uh, so we do have this challenge of, of sort of going beyond the, the white. I mean, it's not too surprising that if you start with a group that's mostly white and male, then the first beneficiaries are going to be the, the white women. So we need to try and push a bit beyond that. Um, and in terms of the developing community, it's still the, the challenge of uh, underrepresented groups in general, in, including white women. We still haven't made um, great inroads in terms of the developer community and by that, I mean people that are actually contributing to R itself or crown packages, bioconductor packages, and so on. So that's still a big challenge. And I'm going to try and talk about both. Um, you'll have to sort of wave if I'm going over time. See how far we get. Um, so starting with the user community, and um, I'm going to focus on particular aspects. You know, so there's, there's many underrepresented groups that we could think about, um, but these are three um, that forwards have been particularly working on and trying to help um, in recent months, and we're sort of focusing on this year. So first is um, people in underserved regions, and by that I mean geographical regions, countries um, where, that don't have the same benefits as, as we might have in, in Europe in the US, where we have a lot of conferences, a lot of meetups, a lot of experts at the universities and in, um, you know, in companies, so we, we're you know, we have a lot on our doorstep uh, that other people don't, don't have the benefit from. Um, so there's sort of a couple of things I'd like to mention um, that's, that we're working on here. So the first is um, the Use R conference um, started in Europe, and then after a while it started alternating between Europe and the US, and then there was one conference in, in Australia, 
So, so far, it's, it's been, you know, in these, in these sort of well-supported regions. Um, and we're trying to move to a model where we have one main conference, and then we have some regional hubs. Um, and we're piloting in Munich this year, which is not an underserved region, um, but uh, it was because it was, you know, the whole plan was fairly last minute, um, and the motivation, in fact, was not um, to uh, serve underserved regions, but to uh, address environmental concerns. So, um, you know, it was really obvious at the USAR conference last year in Toulouse that people were very concerned about the impact on the environment. And obviously, if you have a model where you have one international conference that supposedly serves the, the, the global community, then that it relies on a lot of people doing long-haul flights, which is not environmentally friendly. So, but the model of having one main hub and uh, that connects to regional hubs um, is a nice balance between um, you know, reducing the environmental cost but still maximizing the benefit of in-person in interactions. And people have actually you know, studied this in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the CO2 emissions and so on. You know, it is a good balance. Um, but I see it <laughs> as, a, as a nice way of you know, moving towards uh, uh, other areas. You know, so hopefully in future years, we, we could have hubs in uh, you know, perhaps in Africa, Latin America, and so on. And it would benefit everybody in terms of reduced cost, travel time, um, and also opens exciting possibilities like uh, potentially allowing other languages in English. So far, it's totally 100% English. And maybe we can even be a bit more experimental and, and um, consider remote participation, for example. And either remote participation or regional hubs would really help um, relieve some of the visa issues that I know, um, you know are, are a big barrier to, to some people to, to um, attending conferences. So hopefully we'll, we'll see some developments um, in the next few years on, on this front. Um, another big and exciting thing, you know, partic particularly for, for you guys, um, is the Africa R community. Uh, hopefully you've heard of it, and if not, here it is. I'm in introducing it now. Um, so it uh, kicked off last year, and it was really driven by, by Shelmith from Kenya and, and Dennis from Nigeria, and a few other people that were involved, but those two have really driven it forward. And they've connected people across Africa. Um, and um, so far, um, their focus has just been sort of making connections, and they've been doing that particularly on Twitter. So if you're not follow, following Africa R users and you're on Twitter, I recommend you do that now. And if you're not on Twitter, I would recommend thinking about it. I mean, um, you know, you might not... Uh, I don't know how, how popular it is around here, but it is... Um, the R, R community is very active, and um, you do... It is a really great way to connect to our users around the world and keep up to date on, on the news. Anyhow, back to Africa R. Um, at the, just a month or so ago, they established an expanded leadership team. So they now have much represent, better representation across Africa. So as you can see, uh, the, the pictures here got represent, representatives from Egypt, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, and... South Africa, to Vibash. Vibash, would you stand up? <laughs> yeah. So Vibash is going to be your, your local representative, um, but, but don't let her, or don't expect her to do all the work. You know, please support her in this and see how you can help. Um, I was hoping, this, this Hex logo, I was hoping to bring some stickers to Saturday, and unfortunately they weren't quite printed in time, but hopefully they will be making their way to the community soon so that you can start to, uh, you know, uh, decorate your laptop and show your support. Um, so what have Africa R been doing? As I say, they've been doing a lot on Twitter, but they've also helped to establish various new R user groups. Uh, so, so one that's started recently is the one in Eswatini, and we've got Emmanuel here, who's been leading that group. Give a wave. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, We've had two Saturdays um, ah, with uh, Uganda, I think, and Abidjan. Um, so, uh, as well as, of course, the, the Saturdays that are well established in, in, in South Africa. 
uh, uh, showing how, how to do it uh, for several years. And uh, so their plans for 2020 are to really sort of establish you know, what Africa art is um, by writing them a mission statement, code of conduct, and sort of setting those government documents down. They'd like to have a rotating curated Twitter account. So if that's something that you, you'd like to do, you know, maybe volunteer for a week. It's going to be a bit like the We Are Our Ladies account, if you've ever seen that, where one person from the community will tweet from, the, from that account for the week. And so you get to know different people in the community, how they use R, uh, what, what sort of things they do in their work. Um, another aspect they'd like to work on is tutorials in French. Uh, obviously, particularly in, in West Africa, uh, language can be a big barrier to, to learning about R. And although I've recommended Twitter, not, not everybody wants to use Twitter, so they want to build up a website and a blog, so there's other ways of, of communicating. And they'd also like to work on packages that address African issues. Uh, so just one thing that they, they suggested was a, a natural language programming package that would support uh, common languages like Arabic and Swahili and so on. So if that's something you're interested in, or if you're interested in any of these things, you know, there are members of the leadership team that have, are going to sort of take responsibility for these projects. And so you know, they, they would be able to direct you on, on how to help. So I do get involved. Uh, I've given you seven way, several ways already. Some other things that you can do um, that are really useful are to share your contacts. So I think you know, part of the uh, various things have been tried in Africa before. Maybe you're aware of things that have started and sort of fizzled out. And the whole idea of this is, is to try and be stronger together. Um, so if we can share the contacts we have in different countries, um, then that helps uh, organizers identify potential speakers, hosts for meetups, workshops, and so on. Also consider um, reusing or even creating new talks and workshops that you could give to local groups when you're traveling around uh, or offer to promote, promote, present remotely. So some people are, you know, are quite isolated and, and they don't have a lot of visitors uh, giving great talks and workshops. And um, you know, they, if you've got that little bit more experience, they'd be very grateful to, to hear about you and your work. So maybe think about using your, your Saturday talk if you... If you gave or are giving a, a talk today, and as I say, help, in, help join in with their plans. So I spent quite a lot of time on that, but obviously that's because it's, it's very relevant to, to this group. Um, and our, a couple of other things that I wanted to talk about um, is uh, minority ethnic and racial groups. Um, so if you're a member of a minority or ethnic <coughs> racial group, um, then you, know, you can feel quite isolated and uh, um, well, I mean, life can be hard, as you, as you know, in general. And in the tech community, it can be even harder because often the tech and the data science community isn't even representative of the community around it. Um, so people can be even more isolated. And um, this is something that uh, uh, was felt by um, Danielle Small Perkins, who is an African-American living in the US. And she recently went to the R Studio Conf, just whenever it was in January, and she posted this tweet, Dear Danielle, remember these incredibly brilliant, talented, and kind women data scientists whenever you feel like the only one on a team or in a space. Thanks to our studio comp for bringing us together. Hashtag our ladies. There's a couple of nice pictures of some people that she met on the conference, and it's just uh, you know, um, an indicator of um, how encouraging it can be to go and, and meet people, maybe not from exactly the same um, ethnicity as yourself, but other people who are, you know, um, are, are in the same boat, you know, they're the same one in their R user group or in their company, and you know, you, you can be, you can share experience and empathise with each other, and it's uh, a bit like our ladies supporting each other. It it, it just it just uh, helps to have a space where you can feel comfortable. And inspired by that, Danielle has got together with Doris Scott, who is also a member of the Forwards Task Force, and they set up a new community called MyR, Minorities in R. And uh, they, it's, it's very recent, and they just posted um, on Medium last weekend, um, setting out some ideas for what they could do as part of this community. Um, so some are sort of similar to, to what other communities do, such as the abstract review. That's something that our ladies does uh, do for each other. 
um, and so they think that's a good idea. They can they can borrow. But this new community uh, similarly have a, a Slack for minority um, users, and uh, where they can network together and share opportunities. Um, social media and blog posts, so highlights um, minority users and what they're doing, so so people know about their work and. Um, uh, and similarly, uh, set up a directory where people can just join just to show that they, they want to be part of this community or particularly sort of advertise that they would like to be invited as speakers or that they are um, certified R Studio trainers so that you can, um, you know, you can make use of their skills and, and, and include them. And also perhaps uh, my R Dev Days, um, so encouraging people from minority ethnic and racial groups to make contributions to the our open source ecosystem. So there's some of the things that they'd like to do. I don't know how many people have signed up. I don't know what the latest news is. It's, it's a very new group, um, but um, you know it, it's there if you, um, for us to support. Um, so do let people know if you think this would be interesting to them, it, it, um, or if, of course join yourself if you think this applies to you and you, you can really see the benefit to yourself. Um, they also welcome people um, to join as, as an ally. So if this is something that you'd like to support and uh, you know, give a bit of your time to, then, then you can also welcome to join the, the Slack, and I give the link here. Um, at the moment, they don't have their own Twitter account, so you, would, you should follow Doris or Danielle on, on Twitter to find out the latest. Um, another thing that we're working on in forwards is, is uh, better support for the disabled and deaf community. Um, and so um, Jonathan Godfrey is a member of the Forwards Task Force and for a long time actually he's um, done a lot of work providing many resources. He, he's a blind user himself, he's a statistics lecturer in New Zealand and he's written uh, an e-book that's, um, and it has two versions, one for regular users and one for blind users and for the blind users just helping them uh, get set up with R and how, how they can use it with screen readers and so on. He also maintains a, a mailing list and has written a package to provide extra support, uh, for example, um, to give text descriptions of graphics so that um, you know, uh, blind users can um, make, make the most of R. And, and also for people that aren't blind, um, he's written some help on writing accessible markdown documents so how you can... Um, you know, what you can do to make, make your documents accessible to the widest audience possible. Um, another person that recently joined Forwards, another blind user, Liz Hare, um, has been leading the development of uh, best practices for events, and this is not just thinking about blind users now, but disabled and deaf in general. Um, and this has really helped to start, uh, you know, in, inform our planning for future users, and we're thinking about it much earlier in the process now. So rather than, you know, which is always easier. If you think about it early on, um, rather than trying to re retrofit, it's, it's easier and, and cheaper. So we can start thinking about the facilities of the venue, as I say here. Um, and we hope to continue to integrate these recommendations. At the moment, this, links, this link just goes to a, a markdown file on, on GitHub. But uh, we hope to sort of, um, you know, work on that version and... Uh, uh, have something that we can, we can share. I mean, it's public, you know, but it's not, it's not very well advertised at the moment. Um, so ways, ways that you and, and, and we can help in, in this aspect to, to, to educate yourself about um, uh, accessibility issues and um, in particular to expect disabled people at your events and think proactively about how you can help them. So it, it's actually, um, you know... Uh, already exclusive if, you're, if you wait for people to ask and, and um, you know, wait for them to point out problems. We need to be proactive about this and actually reach out to people and invite them as, as speakers, chairs, committee members, um, you know, without making assumptions, without asking about, about what they'd be prepared to do. Um, and if you have some expertise in this area, then we would uh, welcome your feedback on our, on our best practice um, document that we're working on. It's linked in the slides, and the link is at the bottom of the slides. Okay. 
So it's fine. I'm, you know, I'm nearly at the end of my first section. And, uh, <laughs> so this is just some general tips for creating inclusive communities, and maybe we can skip that in the interest of time. So that we can talk a little bit about the developer community. Um, and uh, I was going to talk a little bit about developer meetings, and this is probably something I can, I can skip through a bit, May, not because you wouldn't be interested in it, but just because I have to be honest that it's, um, the, the developer meetings are, again, held in Europe and the US, and they're not very accessible to, to this community. And so my comments about making those more accessible are at a very early stage of... Um, uh, you know, just getting slightly beyond the, the sort of core developers at the moment. And, um, you know, we haven't even begun really to think about how, how to make that more accessible internationally. Um, but it's worth mentioning because, you know, obviously some, some of you will come to the USAR conference and um, there are uh, or have been in recent years developer meetings that have co-located with the USAR conference. So one is called Directions in Statistical Computing uh, which is the one run by the R Foundation, and it's sort of had different forms, so it was sort of resurrected in 2014, and in its current form, it's, it's been a sort of invited meeting of the R Foundation uh, and special guests that's happened just prior to the Use R meeting. Um, and then there's been another meeting called the R Implementation, Optimization and Tooling Workshop, which is supported by the R Consortium, and that's been parallel to Use R. And um, part of the issues with these, these meetings is that, uh, you know, they're very focused on, on their existing community, uh, you know, just inviting people they already know, or, uh, you know, having these satellite meetings that aren't very well advertised. So at least I'm perhaps making a first step of just making you aware of these, so that if you do go to use our, um, at least, uh, you know, in this year, both... DSC and, and Riot would be open to anybody to attend, so you don't have to be invited to attend them. So do, um, and hopefully um, Riot, which is the one that runs in parallel will, with USAR, will at least be advertised on the USAR website so that you can find out about it um, and um, you know, look out for those sessions uh, and just be aware that some of these side events might be going on and it's good to sort of dig around <laughs> the conference website and see what's going on to, to make sure that you don't miss out. Okay. So moving on, you know, perhaps uh, more relevant to more of you here. Um, package developments. Um, so as I say, Forwards has been working on this by developing the workshop materials. And we've run it a few times now in Auckland, Budapest, Chicago, York, and now <coughs> Johannesburg. Um, so it's had a few iterations and, uh, you know, we tweak it every time. And I think now we're getting, you know, to something that, that's quite usable. And so we're working on a guide for how other people can use this. Um, at, there are user groups, our ladies groups, and, and so on. Um, so I give a couple of links there. Um, and we also have... Um, I, I just put the Johannesburg materials on, on the actual Forwards website so that they're now there as well. Not particularly well linked, but hopefully we'll, um, we'll yeah, spread the word about, about where those links are. Or if you can't find it, you know, just, just contact me and say, well, where do I start? You know, if you'd like to run this, you know, because the whole idea was that we would run the workshop a few times, develop materials, and then these are you know, open, open, they have an open license, Creative Commons license, so that you can reuse them, remix them, uh, and use them in your university or user community. Um, yeah, so um, one thing, so I gave a, a very related talk to this last week at the, in Copenhagen, which, where we had an anniversary meeting to celebrate ours 20th anniversary. So my message that was a little bit more to, um, uh, you know, the established R developers. Um, and one thing I wanted to recognize is it's all very well teaching people how to, how to write packages, but there are, um, you know, particularly new developers can be a bit reluctant or nervous to submit to CRAN, and that, and that could be for various reasons. It could be because they're isolated and they don't have a mentor that's, that they can turn to and say, well, how do, you, how do I do it? Um, 
or it could be because they've had a, a bad experience or they've heard about somebody else who's had a, a bad experience of, of trying to submit to CRAN or uh, asking a question on one of the official mailing lists and um, you know, getting knocked back. Um, so I, I think the, the, at the moment there's, there's not a, a lot of support is, is basically what this slide was, was going through. And um, one thing I've been thinking about a while and I would like to get off the ground, but it's not something I can do by myself, so I'm sort of putting it out there as an idea for, for hopefully um, to interest other people in this idea, um, is that we could have some sort of basic on onboarding service for um, first time and particularly underrepresented submitters, um, just to help them through this, this first submission process that can be quite daunting and seem like an insurmountable barrier. Um, and I think for uh, experienced developers, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a huge amount of work. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we would have to do um, you know, an extensive code review, but the point would be to guide people through the steps they, they should do before their first submission, and just to help with any errors or issues that come up. Um, and if they get knocked back by CRAN, just to help help them respond, help them understand what the problem is, um, and give a little guidance on, on the next steps, you know, what, what, what should, when or how would they resubmit. Um, and then work with the CRAN team and with the community um, more generally about um, uh, maintaining a, a, the, the checklist for new submissions or um, community um, lists of things, things com common problems, you know, so that there are more resources to help uh, help people in, in their first submission to CRAM. So um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's sort of interested in that idea and would like to take it further. Um, so how, how much time have I got left? About three minutes. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about our core um, and, you know, the fact that it's been recognized for a while. It's, it's not a very diverse team. Uh, in particular, there, there aren't any women on our core at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit of what I've learned from, from the Python community because I've been sort of watching what they've been doing in recent years. They've been also struggling with this issue. So uh, a few years ago, um, Guido van Rossum, who was the benevolent dictator for life, the sort of head guy, um, said that he wanted to see some women join the core team, sort of put out that announcement. Um, and said that he would help mentor women, you know, to, to, to get to that position. And it took a little bit longer than, than his ambition, but they have started to have women join the core team. So I was interested to see, you know, how had that worked? What, had, what, what difference had, had they made? And uh, in fact, Marietta Winyaya um, was the first woman to join the Python core dev team. And she described the process. It's a really great talk from PyCon a couple of years ago. Um, so she explains how uh, she started by reading the dev guide. So Python has a very comprehensive guide um, to how to do development on Python. So that in itself is something we're missing really in the R community. Um, she joined the Python dev mailing list, which is quite similar to our R Devel mailing list, if you've ever heard of that, um, about the development of the language itself. Um, but also a core mentorship list. Um, and then she was able to look at the bug tracker, which doesn't just track bugs for Python, it also um, tracks issues like GitHub issues um, of, of, of developments they'd like to make. And then she proposed a pull request. And one thing that was interesting to me was that you don't need any special permissions to do this. This is just something that anybody interested can, can start on that path and access all these resources. Um, so the extra step of going to of being invited to be a core developer then comes from earning trust by doing this more and more, you know, doing those pull requests, reviewing pull requests, interacting on the mailing list, and as well as the mailing list, they've got a couple of other social platforms. Um, and they also have a sort of intermediate role of um, rather than just working on bugs, um, you have, can become a developer with a capital D which means that you're able to triage issues on the, on the bug tracker. So they have a sort of, a sort of intermediate uh, role of responsibility that I thought was quite interesting. So I won't go through all the detail here, but if this is something 
you're interested to sort of look into further about how Python works. I mean, I think it's quite interesting to compare different communities. Uh, so Victor Steiner, who's also on the core team, gave an update at PyCon last year and was talking about mentoring as a scalable solution, not just to uh, the diversity problem, but also to core dev burnout. He, he experienced burnout himself and had to completely withdraw from development for a while. Um, and I think in the R community, as, as was highlighted earlier, you know, um, the core team is getting older, so we also have this issue of succession that, that is a, a, a problem for the community. So I mentioned a couple of other communities. I think I'm going to have to skip them due to time, but my slides will be available. Um, and just to say that our core are starting to think about this and how they can reach out. And at USAR 2020 this year, that there will be a slot to joining a keynote talk where they sort of say a bit more about what our core does. They are planning a, a session that will be dedicated to our core speakers and have, it, have a tutorial um, led by one of the core team. So they are starting to think about this a bit and hopefully we can in, encourage them to think about um, diversity and inclusion as at the same time. So this is my summary, which is good because Gemma's <laughs> ready to kick me off any minute. Um, uh, just to say that um, you know, there's a lot of work going on and it's really great to see. I think the R community um, is, is, is recognized as being an inclusive community and, and, and doing a lot of work in this area, even though we might not be perfect. And I think Forwards is playing its part here. Um, and there are a lot of ideas and things um, both outside and inside the, our community of how we can do more uh, in terms of improving the representation of the developer community. Um, and, but that's sort of going beyond forwards and we need more help from the, the wider community and active participation of uh, people that are already contributing to our core. <laughs>